<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> have all access to that. <laughs> what are these? Oh, for the mics? Oh, man, this chair is going to bother me. I feel like I need to be sitting on a phone call. I feel like I should be sitting on a phone call. You want a different one? Uh, it just feels so awkward. Actually, yeah, I can hear No, no, turn down that. I don't like these miniature chairs either. Yeah. Thank you. This new, uh, right. new Thank look you. here. Yeah, new official. Could be like there. an old communist <laughs> country. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I don't feel like a 12 year old. Or even less. Is it seven? Seven o'clock. Yeah, so. Yes. Okay. Let's stand for the pledge. You want to do that? that? Way. <laughs> oh. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Mayor, could we call for some accurate reporting on whether we do or do not do the pledge in our village? Sure. You want to make a comment about what we do? Uh, we do the pledge in our village. Yeah, I believe the town board does the pledge before every meeting, and so does the school board. Um, okay. I want to add a few things to the agenda. First topic, um, we could add this as the first thing under the business agenda, a discussion about adding a couple of um, vacation days for some employees. Um, next topic, uh, I'd like to discuss uh, returning an escrow for a planning board applicant. You can add that as the second item under the business agenda. Item after that is regarding uh, Mr. Chapman's proposal at the uh, Sojourner Truth Park. Um, another item to add would be, so we have number eight on the business agenda mm -hmm. regarding the, um, the next round of CFA, we would want to apply for the, um, as we've done in the past, the Small Cities Grant regarding our DEC consent order for sewer. I got an update on that. So it's a new item? Or it's a new item. Or so it's, it's, it's kind of 8A. 8A. Yes. I, I wanted that in there as a placeholder, so I do not forget to mention it. Um, and then we can conclude the meeting with an example final letter um, that you have on your topic. It, it has to do with complying with the, um, the sanitary sewer upgrades on uh, a couple of the, the streets north of Main Street. So you can make that a final thing. Let me see. Is that 24A or is that? Yeah, we're going to make that. We're going to make that. Um, we're going to make that 26. 26. And I want to be uh, consistent um, mm -hmm. and pleasant and, 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 and positive and everything. I just explained that I come from a culture with the Board of Education where unless we received information on a topic on the Friday before a meeting, we could not discuss it or, or have a discussion. So that's my, that's my, my background and training. I'm yeah. wondering if these, all these items that you're adding at the table are time sensitive and need to be done tonight or whether we could possibly. Donna, I'm, I'm very, very aware of adding things at the table. I would never add anything at the table if it wasn't a very simple concept to be discussed um, or anything that would require significant review of of new information so you have you have made that comment in the past and I am very sensitive to it 
anything that I'm adding tonight, anything that I ever add at the table is something that's very simple to digest. Well, there was no, no criticism implied. I just no, I, I know, but I, I just to be yeah, super yeah, sure, clear, sure. I, I've heard you mention that before, and I'm completely on board. I do not want to add anything at the table that requires review. So if I'm adding stuff, I, I just want to reassure you that the only reason I'm doing it is because it is time sensitive or it's something that we can easily agree on. Uh, so given the simplicity of the first two items, that is adding vacation days and returning an escrow to an applicant, why could we not have those done just under the consent agenda and uh, be done with it? I'm not you, even sure who escrow is being returned. Yeah, we have to discuss. We have to okay. just say that's what it is. It's not. No, there's no. Not, not, not okay with, problem with it. I just, it's okay with me. I'm just looking I'm, for. Uh, uh, given that we have a 24, 26 uh, item agenda, I'm looking for whatever efficiencies I can achieve. Okay. So uh, we've had this interesting discussion. I'm not going to object to anything on the agenda. I just okay. wanted to express my move that we accept the agenda as uh, amended. Actually, I, I want to correct myself. Um, eight should be eight A and eight B. Great. And what I can do to, to make this agenda even smoother is take number twenty four, and that will be uh, part of discussion uh, agenda item five because it's all related. All right. So. Okay, so you, you motion to accept agenda. I second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, a couple of announcements. We have a um, regional education and training program coming up. It's regarding integrating stormwater goals with the community planning and design. It's being presented by Hudson Valley Regional Council on Tuesday, March 29th between 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. at the SUNY Student Union Building, room 6263. And it's free, but um, they're encouraging folks to pre-register. Um, we can include information on the website, anyone wanting to participate in this, this stormwater seminar at SUNY on March 29th, Tuesday. And then another uh, announcement has to do with the fifth annual Riverkeeper Sweep. Our planner um, <coughs> is organizing an event that involves some tree planting and cleanup at the Sojourner Truth Park at Plains Road, and that will take place on Saturday, May 7th, between 9.30 and 12.30. This is a, a save the date. Another announcement. Go ahead. Um, on April 23rd, um, Plattic Hill Avenue, a section of it will be closed for a joint um, fire department and um, Rescue Squad Community Day. Um, there will be live music and <coughs> things for kids and trucks and fun stuff. So it's from 11 to 3 on April 23rd. And that's also a, a recruitment effort mm -hmm. to try to encourage folks to volunteer for the fire department, both as firefighters and as auxiliary um, fire people. Um, no other announcements? Public comment, anyone here for public comment? No? Okay, we have a presentation from our housing board chair, Guy Kemp. You wanna come up and uh, make sure that mic's on? Is this live? Okay. You're good. So, uh, good evening. <clears throat> I have brought with you a summary of the report that has been submitted to the board from the Affordable Housing Board. Um, if you could share this down the line and uh, share this with the audience as well. As the board is aware, um, the, uh, the Affordable Housing 
law in the village requires, <clears throat> um, excuse me, I'm getting over a little bit of a cold, so I have a throat thing, respiratory thing going, um, requires from us that we provide you an annual report um, to um, identify a number of particulars that are um, activities of the, the housing board, including the number of units available in the community, the size of the waiting list for affordable housing, and so forth. Because we're just really beginning, we're at the, the uh, I think we're at going to be this month having the fifth meeting since establishing a quorum. We actually don't have a housing list yet. We haven't created or approved any construction of affordable units pursuant to the law. So there really wasn't very much to report. But I did want to take the opportunity of the report to provide to you some information and a snapshot of housing available in the community to try to inform you, to, uh, to raise consciousness about the need for affordable housing in the community, and um, to, uh, to help call attention to, uh, to our work for the public. So um, <clears throat> as a, at the time of this report, the only affordable housing constructed in the, uh, in the village of New Paltz is Huguenot Park Apartments, which was, of course, created um, many years ago, uh, I think a decade or so ago. Um, on North Chestnut Street. It has 24 one-bedroom units um, that are age-restricted and income-restricted, avail available only to senior citizens. And um, <clears throat> that, uh, that constitutes the entire stock of affordable housing located within the village. In the future, we anticipate that we'll be reporting to the board on an annual basis the additional units that have been created as time goes on. Um, I called attention in the report to the NewYorkHousingSearch.gov website, which provides a resource to um, citizens of New Paltz, residents in need of affordable housing um, for opportunities elsewhere. The, uh, the market trends in New Paltz um, identified in the report um, show that uh, there's a 15% year-over-year rise in the median sales price of houses and a 1% rise in the median price of rent for rental units in the village and within the New Paltz com community each month. According to Trulia, the average median rent for apartments in the entire New Paltz community, they don't distill it down just to the village but include the town as well, um, was $1,850 a month. That's the, again, the overall median rent for units in New Paltz. According to Trulia, the median sales price for homes in New Paltz from September 17th to December 16th of 2015 um, was $289,250 based on 12 home sales available in the community. Um, the current 2016 median home cost in New Paltz is estimated to be roughly $268,000. That's the price of admission if you want to be a homeowner, at least the, the median price of admission in our community. Home appreciation in 2014 was estimated to be, be in the negative at 2.80%, uh, but again, we, we associate that primarily with um, the, uh, the housing crisis that we've been recovering from in the last couple of years. The um, average price per square foot for, um, for New Paltz is $183 per square foot, which uh, reflects an increase of 17% compared to the same period last year. We uh, compiled a good deal of data just to understand that as a part of this snapshot of, of what housing availability is in the community. Uh, from Craigslist, we compiled ads um, into a, a spreadsheet and tried to determine exactly what was available and what it cost. You have here, a, a chart that illustrates the general size of units from studio to, to a four bedroom, um, the number of units available, the price range, and the rent. So for instance, this chart shows us that if you have a large family and you're looking for <coughs> a, a three bedroom unit, um, there are 12 available, and the price range runs from $1,200 to $2,010 a month, and the average rent for those units is uh, $1,619 a month. 
I, uh, I like to put th all of this data in the context of how much folks earn. And um, usually the baseline for considering that is minimum wage. As you may realize or remember, as of um, the, uh, the end of last year, the New York State minimum wage rose to $9 per hour. <coughs> which uh, equals, if you multiply it out against a 40-hour work week, an income of $18,720 a year. And after tox taxes, you net $15,919, um, based again on that 40-hour work week. Theoretically speaking, a wage earner earning that level in a single-person household would have a gross income available just for housing of one third of their income, or $520 a month. And New Paltz, like every other community in the country, you realize that a single individual family member earning minimum wage cannot afford to rent an apartment in our community. So that's why the work that we're undertaking as an affordable housing board in my mind, is so important to the community. There's also another source to help us understand this, and that's called the Living Wage Calculator. It was created in 2004 <coughs> by a, a PhD at MIT. And uh, <coughs> it's been updated and compiled as recently as uh, April 20th of 2015. And I provided for you a chart that illustrates um, what the actual living wage is to afford a, uh, a, an apartment and actually live in all of Ulster County. <clears throat> so again, that's only a, calculated on a county level. But it shows that uh, a single adult would need to earn a living wage of at least $10.92 an hour, extrapolated out over that 40-hour work week, to be able to actually afford to live in this community without being cost burdened. Um, I also provided for you here in the summary the fair market rent summary. That is the number that's, that's created uh, under the auspices of the, the, uh, the federal HUD uh, Housing and Urban Development. And uh, they identify the, uh, the fair market rent for one bedrooms and efficiencies up to four bedrooms in Ulster County. It's actually calculated for the Kingston Metropolitan Statistical Area, or MSA, which New Paltz is a part of. And it identifies that a fair market rent for a wooden bedroom is $856 a month. With that said, it also, it also provides income limits for as an eligibility criteria for HUD assistance to afford those units for individuals who are low and very low income earning. So that's sort of a summary of the, um, the housing availability and housing need we have in our community. And uh, I also want to call to your attention that there are, and we now have uh, printed some, and I believe that it's available not only here in hard copy, but also on the website. There are, there's an application to get onto a waiting list to identify need for the affordable housing units that will be created in um, New Paltz in future years um, and throughout the end of this year. Um, and I'm going to make those available. They're, uh, they're here. I believe that the, the board has already seen that, and I believe that that's available in digital copies on the, the website. And with that said, that's, the, that's the, uh, the end of the presentation I have for you today. I understand that there might be some questions from the board, having had the opportunity to review the, uh, the report, and I'll be happy to try to answer, answer them for you today. Any questions? Comments? Thanks, Guy. I have a question. Um, it's really just uh, looking to see if you have any additional data to support what I am assuming. The living wage calculation for Ulster County, when I think about Ulster County, I'm inclined to think that New Paltz has a higher cost of living than anywhere else in the county. So in looking at this chart, I mean, do you have any data to support that? I, th I think you're, I th anecdotally, I believe you're correct. Um, unfortunately, the data available doesn't really drill down to the village level. It drills down as low as the town level in most cases. 
and um, the MIT calculator clearly doesn't drill down below the county level because the data sets that they rely on aren't available to right. them. We could, at uh, some considerable time and possibly expense, try to generate um, some more data locally, but I'm not certain that it would tell us terribly much more than we already know. Yeah, I'm which, just looking at yeah. this and I'm thinking, this is probably not completely accurate. It's probably worse than what this is it, saying. It tends to understate the problem, I think, is right. your point, and I would agree. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Not just for answering my question, but for your dedicated service on our board. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Well, your report was very comprehensive, so uh, uh, I don't have a lot of questions. It, it was very, um, it illustrated why this board exists and what the issue is that we're trying to uh, trying to address, and, and I, I am very pleased that whenever a new development has come, been presented to this board over the, since I've been on the board, one of the first questions is, you know, what are you doing to comply with the affordable housing law? So as buildings take place and development take place, I'm hopeful that will, that will expand that list because it's a pretty uh, bleak picture right now. But that's why you're here. Thank you very much. I agree. Yeah. And I appreciate that. Um, I would encourage folks that are looking for affordable units um, affordable housing uh, that they incur I had encouraged them to to fill out an application and get it into the hands of the clerk so that we can begin to compile um, something beyond the anecdotal data that we've been talking about but some more specific um, information about the scope of need in the community which in the future I expect we would be reporting to you guy I had a question about uh, medium household income because we've been using the 2010 census data. So for the village, yeah. it was 42K. And for the town, including the village, it was 60, 63K. So each year, HUD updates the, um, the AMI chart that they use. It's, it, it, and I, if you look, I think I provided um, underneath that chart some explanation of how that's compiled. In years past, that was actually compiled based on boots on the ground kind of analysis. It no longer is. They, um, they, it's an estimate. I also want to say that while relying on the, 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 uh, the census that's done every 10 years is absolutely respectable and appropriate, there are updates that are compiled each year and projections that are made. We had, for a number of years, been able to rely on an annual publication of, of the community survey. And um, that's really not being published like it once was, and the extent of the data set has, has been reduced. So we don't have um, a, an alternative set of data to look at. I um, hope I'm answering your question. I think that for most purposes, you're going to re rely on the, the census done um, every 10 years. But there are um, uh, community surveys that update that, and we're able to, to kind of glean um, more current information in some cases. So I, I realize that it can be updated, and it seems like you're using um, a service that's providing updates, like you have the 2015 income limit of 75 well, keep in mind that's for Ulster County correct the first what you need to understand is that relates to eligibility for HUD programs and that is calculated on the the level of the metropolitan statistical area which includes Ulster County it's called the Kingston sometimes called the Kingston Poughkeepsie metropolitan statistical area and it includes New Paltz so that's why I refer to that that is the only published guideline that comes out every year from HUD that tells us what um, the, the, the income guidelines and therefore the eligibility are for specific programs as they, they relate to housing and, and all kinds of social benefits. Does that answer that question? Sure, but, but I, I think what's noteworthy is even if you're using this 2015 estimate, the 2010 census data for New Paltz is significantly lower than the countywide number. Right, for new, I mean, we could say that the village at 42K MHI drags down New Paltz overall, but even with the village at 63K medium household income for the town, including the village, right. it's significantly lower than this 75K. Okay, number. so understood. 
um, obviously when you're looking in larger geographic areas, it, it tends to be equalized out among higher earning areas. And that's what happens for that chart that comes from HUD. I understand your point that the village of New Paltz is significantly lower in, if you look out at um, income relative to per capita population, it is a significantly different picture. And, and that point is well taken. If you want to come up and join, we, we just need to hear you on the mic, the microphone. This is Ellen James, a, a member of the Affordable Housing Board. Yeah, just some clarification, possibly. Um, when I was working on the master plan back about uh, eight, year, eight years ago or whatever, um, Dorothy Jessup was there and could explain these things to us. The um, income for, for the village of New Paltz is influenced by the fact that there are so many students here. Yes. who, and many of them are counted as just according to whatever low income they have. And I don't know exactly how that works, given their ages and their parents and stuff, but that's one of the reasons why it's lower. We, we know that there are approximately, you know, somewhere between 800 and 1,000 students who are residents of New Paltz, and they're counted in the population of the village, and we know that that has an effect on the... Um, the median household income in the village. So yeah, it is something that has to be taken into account. Any other questions, comments, thoughts, concerns for me? Thank you for your work. Thank, Thank you. you. Folks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Alan and Kathy. Um, at the risk of uh, some irony, I think we need to add an item to the agenda at the table. We want? I think we need to add, add an item to the agenda, which is strange coming from me. Uh, I might be mistaken, but I believe we need to adopt the tentative budget tonight. I thought it was on, it's the, on there. It's, it's on the agenda. It's on there. Three times. Oh. I saw it. Never some, mind. Okay. I saw it someplace today. Okay. All right. Never mind. I don't know when I was going I through my it. additions to the agenda, did I include an update regarding the, the sidewalk grant? I don't know. Nope. No. Can I? I, I would like to, because we had a actually a an illuminating meeting today with uh, the engineer. So it's an, it's an action, it doesn't require any action on it. It does not board. require any action, but I, I wanted to update the board and the it's public. A friendly okay. addition, so. Okay, I'd like to make a motion that we accept a consent Second. agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, um, I'll, ju I'll start with that sidewalk grant discussion. So um, our former planner applied for a grant and it included three sections of sidewalk. Huguenot Street, um, the corner of Henry W. and Prospect, and the corner of Church and Henry W. And basically what all three of these sidewalk pieces have in common is they, they, they link existing sidewalks with each other. So all of them basically don't have sidewalks on the corners, so there would be new sidewalk that would connect. Um, the total cost of the project um, was estimated at $252,000 for these three sections of sidewalk. The, the, the total linear footage is just over 1,200 feet. Um, so we have selected an engineering firm and we received some initial response and basically 252 as an estimate is entirely too low um, entirely. entirely too low um, and also of the 252 you'll recall from our, our budget presentation last week that the village would be responsible for 51 thousand dollars of that 252 if the project costs 252 so there were a couple of things that were not included basically the the engineering fee um, is going to cost the estimate is eighty eight thousand dollars and we had only budgeted for <coughs> thirty five um, the construction inspection we budgeted for um, twelve thousand dollars it's going to be more likely to be $52,000 and um, we budgeted $12,000 for the construction inspection 
um, but it's more likely going to cost $52,000. And then the project, from a construction point of view, is going to cost $20,000 more. So that's a total of $113,000 more than we expected. So the, the way these things work, too, um, we would be responsible for all of that overage. So the $51,000 that we had already committed to plus 113 gets you to $164,000 if we were to do this sidewalk project as it is currently designed. And this, you know, nothing's gone out to bid yet either, so who knows where the bids would end up. But these are the estimates right now. So we, we spent a fair amount of time trying to identify how else could we pursue this project. And it seems like there may be an opportunity to, um, to use some different materials on Huguenot Street, which um, might not be reviewed favorably by uh, folks who were very focused on having slate sidewalks on Huguenot Street, but if we pour concrete instead of slate, that could uh, be a significant savings. The challenge with that, though, is uh, there are SHPO rules in terms of historic preservation. They may or may not allow this. So we're going to investigate whether that's an option. We're going to update the estimates to see if that's even possible. Um, because as it stands now, the, the federal government is willing to contribute $200,000 to the sidewalk project if it cost, well basically, they're only willing to contribute $200,000, but now the project looks like instead of costing 252, it's going to cost 365. So I don't see us being able to come up with $164,000 um, if that's the case, if we're not able to identify savings and, and, and I, I'm somewhat optimistic that the engineering firm is going to figure out a way to, to lower the price um, by using different materials, but that's where we are. So are we obligated to uh, work on all three portions of this plan at once? That was my question Can we, too. we do two cut three? out the portion that is creating the problem? Um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like these federal grants are very rigid in, in how they work. Like you basically, A, have to start this year, and, and B, have to do exactly what you proposed. There's no room for deviation. But another opportunity that we may have, because I was spending a fair amount of time with our grant writer, Mark Blower, and we gave a call to the town, we were going to see if there would be an opportunity to use some town highway um, to potentially collaborate with them and have them um, do some of the work instead of using a, an outside third party. Because the town is planning on running sidewalks down Henry W. to Prospect? No, or, they, th or is that the, the town is theory? looking to um, improve the road on Henry W. and they were going to stripe basically pedestrian bike lanes but not concrete sidewalks. Not so this is, our, our thinking is, and, and we gave a call to Chris Marks to begin um, to see if this is even an option, but there may be an option if, if we use the highway department and, and pay the, the, the town highway department as opposed to a third party. You know, kind of similar, it's, it's similar to what we pursued in terms of the, uh, the vehicle, the vehicle uh, uh, intermunicipal yeah. agreement with with the highway department. So may I ask, um, how, how many uh, competing bids were there? And were there any negotiations among the bidders? For uh, engineering? Yeah. OK, um, there were three or four engineering firms that, um, and we so we selected HVEA. They're actually the same engineering firm that's doing the work. Um, I just know this because I saw them in another meeting. They're doing the work. Um, for the county project at South Putt, but um, we selected them as a selection committee, but uh, their price in terms of what they estimate their cost would be came out after we selected them. 
I feel pretty confident that their their estimate is solid. I mean, you know, they were able to to go through our original estimate and identify, you know, where it it kind of came up short, and um, it was kind of estimated very generally, and even our engineering firm, Bernier and Larios, who worked on um, the project out in Gardner, they said with a lot of the, the, the DOT related inspections that these things cost a, a great deal of money to, to get inspected. And, um, and, and nothing, has gone, nothing has gone to bid yet. Um, I see no reason why their estimates in terms of the cost of construction would come in lower than what they're, they're estimating. It seems though odd that we had uh, an estimate of twelve thousand dollars for construction review, and they're coming in at fifty-two thousand. Am I right? Yes, that's 52, right. Fifty-two thousand. Our our budget included twelve, and 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 blue blue our um, DPW superintendent said no. Fifty-two K is what is what he understands the the construction inspection would cost. Uh, perhaps I have no other question. Yeah, I'm, I'm just interested in moving forward that we protect ourselves from this sort of situation before again. You know, the the original estimate we got, you know, could have been better, obviously. You know, the, 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 obviously to me. Yeah. The brainstorming session that we had with with the engineer and our, our public works guys, it, it's and and our grant writer, it seems like this kind of federal money makes a great deal of sense when you have a huge project mm -hmm. um, because the soft costs are X. So when that's spread across, you know, we're doing 1,200 linear feet. If we were doing like 20, you know, a, a serious yeah. multiple, then the, the soft cost would be X and that would make a whole lot more sense. Um, but a, a relatively small sidewalk project, um, you know, what, what we should have done is, and when we bounced around this idea, we should have asked for more money, but that also is no guarantee that you get it. You know, the town also, uh, at the same time that we were awarded this, the town had an application for a larger sidewalk project that they were not awarded. Mm -hmm. So, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. We could say, oh, we should have threw in more sidewalks and it should have been a bigger project, and then that would make the soft cost make more sense. But um, then we could have easily not been awarded any. Okay. Where the the, um, the bluestone for Huguenot Street? Where would that be coming from? And there, there, so there's we got a couple of things going on. Do you buy new bluestone? Do you use what's there? Mm -hmm. So we're looking at every possible option right. to see if we can get this price lower. Yeah, I'm, my thought also just like walking up and down Platical Avenue. There's so many areas that are in such bad disrepair in terms of where we already have bluestone. And I'm just curious if, if it would be possible for us um, to bring the cost down more by doing our own little sidewalk project where we, where we reuse some of the bluestone on, on Political Avenue and use lesser expensive materials to replace the bluestone. You mean mine, mine, platted, mine, my street. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Tom. Not in front of your I, I don't think that's a bad no, idea at my, all. Your, your of, sidewalk is, is in front the of worst, my house, and I blame you, Tom. There's, old con there's concrete, and it's perfectly fine. It works well. The bluestone that runs from just beyond my property all the way down to the uh, parking the lot for the bank, yeah. uh, the bank is a mess. Mm -hmm. It's awful. It, it's one of the worst streets in the village. And I can't imagine that handicapped persons easily uh, traverse that area at all. No, they walk in the street. We they see them walk the in the street every day. Yeah. Um, so in addition to looking at, and I think that's a good idea, we can throw that out to, to the engineering firm to see if that makes any sense. Yeah. Um, but we're also looking at other combinations. Do you do a concrete curb with blue stone? Do you do a granite curb with blue stone? Do you do all concrete? Um, we also threw out like what the college has done, um, where they have a concrete curb and then blacktop. I think that would make a little bit less sense because what we're doing is we're connecting existing <coughs> concrete sidewalks. So do we necessarily want to introduce another material when no. the, the plan is to connect 
sidewalks. I, I think there's, there is a case to be made for using concrete at Huguenot Street because you have the sidewalks in front of town and country on the Walk L and, and uh, in front of town and country on North Front, which are both concrete. So you would be linking concrete with concrete, even though what's currently there is bluestone. But um, you know, we hope to we hope to have a better sense of how much this might cost. But uh, it, it was a fairly frustrating conversation too, in that it, it does not necessarily make sense for us to spend one hundred and sixty-four thousand. Like we just didn't, you know, we budgeted for fifty-one. We didn't budget for an additional one hundred and thirteen thousand dollars. Yeah, I feel very strongly that there should be sidewalks down in the end of Prospect, down Henry W., and at the corner of Church, there is a giant gap there. I see people all summer walking to the pool down Prospect Street, getting forced into the road. It's very uncomfortable. My own family does it. I hear my mother-in-law very unhappy with it. It's not safe, but this is an awful lot of money for 1,200 feet of sidewalk. So. I think we do need to focus on that. Even if this doesn't come to pass now, this needs to be on our wish list, so to speak, because that is a safety hazard. But, but I, I, I still feel like there's some hope that we can make this um, award from the federal government work, mm -hmm. um, but we're going to have to look really hard at the budget. And there's no other way, uh, given the time constraints that you know of, where there would be an additional grant opportunity, you know, given that we're at the penultimate moment now. Right? We couldn't get additional or supplementary funding from the grant else. to subsidize our grant. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. It had that also happens. Yeah. I lived on grants uh, totally for a number of mm -hmm. years. Now, is there any way that I, I know with um, or lack of snow this winter that we should have some um, un unspent funding through the DPW? Is well, there any way we you know, look our, at our that? budget currently involves a zero percent tax increase, mm -hmm. um, so that includes the savings that we achieve this summer okay. by not by not uh, plowing roads and salting as much as we did the, the previous few years. Well. If, okay. no, if no further negotiation is possible and no further grant opportunities are possible, we will have to await your uh, deliberation and what you tell us is possible uh, within the constraints of a no tax increase budget. Yeah. So, and that no tax increase budget includes fifty-one thousand dollars spent exactly. on this sidewalk on yes. this sidewalk project. Yes. Okay. Um, the, the next thing I added was I wanted to float the idea of providing our non-union village employees with some extra vacation days. And the, the thinking is um, the union employees are receiving a raise because you know that's part of their contract. Our budget includes no raise for our non-union employees. So I was considering providing them with something and I was thinking two additional vacation days for full-time employees and one additional vacation day for the part-time employees and they would just have to use it between now and the end of fiscal year, May 31, 2017. How many vacations do they currently, how many vacation days do they currently get? I don't know. So this, in lieu of uh, any raise. In lieu all, of a raise. They had no raise at all. So this would not add anything to the budget, but it would give them, in effect, a, uh, a, a little, bonus. like a, a little, it's like something. a lawn yacht, you know. I don't know. I, yeah, I, 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 I just would like to have a little time to think about it and think about whether we, we might want to. <coughs> I, I understand the decisions may have been made not to do raises and to do this in, in response, but I would like to you know, think about it and see if there are any other suggestions or thoughts that we have. <coughs> that, yeah, that, I like the idea of kind of 
floating this idea. Let's okay. sleep on it. Let's uh, compare providing a raise versus these additional couple of days. Um, that's it. Good creative thought, though. Yep. Okay. Uh, next item that I added had to do with returning a planning board escrow. So there's a, a gentleman who had an application before our planning board for the Church Street Cafe. That project is is not happening, um, or at least not in currently before the planning board. So he was required to put up a one thousand dollar escrow. So we just want to return the escrow because that that project's closed out. Nothing's moving forward with that. So send him back his money. So usually we have to approve the return of any escrow. Okay, just like a set agenda. I haven't noticed that in past meetings. Okay. We normally don't have escrow to return. Or yeah. Just, yeah. Could we add that to the consent agenda uh, uh, in future uh, instances? It doesn't happen that often. No, no, but just, then it could just be on the consent agenda. When it does happen, we don't have to talk about it. Sure. Okay. Sounds good. I'll so make a motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Um, next item we added, um, Mr. Chapman. we had, we had um, Mr. Chapman present his idea regarding using uh, the Sojourner Truth Park for his kayak concept yes. and business. Um, we spoke about the idea of leasing um, the property to him. I spoke with an attorney, uh, not our attorney, so it was another attorney, so we were not paying for this discussion. Um, and his suggestion was a non-exclusive license. And the idea is that the, um, we would provide this non-exclusive license in exchange for the improvements that Mr. Chapman was talking about making to the to the property so there would be no money exchanging hands but the village would benefit by the improvements to the property and the suggestion was it would be a one-year term terminable upon six months notice by either party um, so just floating that idea would we not have to pass the uh, the license by our own attorney? Oh, we don't have a draft of a document. Yeah. No, I understand. But when it's yes, when it's absolutely. done, yes, we would have to know for sure that we can do this, and that we would not be liable. That all liability would uh, fall on the agent of the improvements and the operation of the uh, commercial enterprise that would take place there. It, this was suggested to me um, by Open Space Institute's general counsel, Bob Anderberg. This is what he suggested to me as far as a way to, okay. to provide access to Mr. Chapman that the community would benefit from. I'm uh, definitely in favor of uh, enabling Mr. Chapman to uh, uh, utilize that space. I think it's been a great, uh, great effort. Uh, I did recall reading somewhere that the uh, the proposal to Im do improvements on that space had been withdrawn, and I'm not sure if I that you want to go to the, the old arrangement. I think I remember reading something along those lines. You want to? You can go up to the yeah. to mic and let's have we can have a conversation. Here, you got to take take the mic. Oh yeah, the yeah. Excuse me. Sorry, no problem. So, due to the fact that uh, it's not a uh, necessarily a quick hitter, there's some things to work out between us uh, in order for that. Uh, to proceed, um, the season is right around the corner. I have uh, the college booked uh, 40 boats, 40 students going out uh, uh, April 30th. Um, so my thought was, well, if we can renew the old agreement uh, in the short term and then work together to as, as quickly as possible, because I would like it to be you know, nice, I'm sure everybody would be uh, in favor of that, as quickly as possible, I work out this non-exclusive uh, license. Um, and then go go forward with uh, that proposal. So it is kind of being taken back, but at the same time, it's I, that's what I would like to do. I, there's a lot of support out there to, to make it nice down there, and uh, it, it, we just got to figure out how to make it happen. So um, that what I would propose again is uh, the old contract, which is uh, I wouldn't be selling anything except kayak rentals, uh, no waters, no no chashkis, no anything uh, in return for five percent of the gross of the um, the gross sales, and, uh, and and that is the, the basics of the 
agreement or the contract, uh, really no no frills in it at all. So, just a few steps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We should have it on our next agenda so that he has approval at the time. I, um, because everything takes time and everything involves attorney review, which costs us money, I would rather focus on getting the, the non-exclusive license. And you know, I think we can do this mm -hmm. in the next few weeks. I like to do that. Because what, what's important about that type of agreement is that we would be looking to indemnify the village, um, which I don't know whether that was discussed in the, the previous arrangement. And I think that's a very important. If, if it, <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so yes, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and if you if you believe that that we can uh, move forward with it, then and, uh, in, a, in a somewhat short amount of time, then I'm absolutely uh, uh, put it in your hands and say uh, whatever you need from me, we can make that happen uh, for sure. I mean, this is this is um, government work, so things often move slowly, but I feel like we can make a commitment to try to review this document, get it to you so you can review it, and then get it signed before your, you know, your business really starts up by the end of April. Thank you. I don't think that's a scary concept. Because I'd rather do it once correctly versus reviewing two different types of documents. It, it was just scaring me a little bit because I had to, I got to buy new boats, I have to, you know, gear up more or less. Um, so it's like, well, if, if there was a problem, then it's like, oh, well, what am I going to do? So if, if you guys feel like you can do it, then I'm, I'm willing to give it a try and, and let's do it once and do it right. That makes complete sense yeah. to me. Greg, can you uh, give me a ballpark because I have no idea just off the top of your head on how much income this generates? Yeah, la la last year, I mean, every year it's, it's grown by, you know, three or 4000 So last year it was uh, $14,750. Uh, not all of that was done at Sojourner Truth Park. Uh, I count it all towards, you know, paying, paying you guys. Uh, but a lot of it is Chodiki Lake. Uh, a lot of it was in Walk Hill. I go over there uh, uh, right off uh, 208. Um, but as I said, I, I mean, I have the arrangement with you guys, so I just do the, the, the whole gross of, of the Paul's kayaking tours uh, to that. So that's what it was, uh, May, May through October, $14,750. Yep. That was the gross of the business? This, this past year, yes. So the village received 5% of that, or that the was what village, the village received? We'll be getting a check. I just have my taxes all done. So 700 and I actually had that written out, right. $737.50 is what it, it was so uh, that's those are the numbers that have been uh, floated around and uh, you know if we go forward we can we can talk about that and see uh, see if things make sense so well we're both members of the Walt Hill River Alliance and we're looking to potentially dedicate some of those funds toward the, the dues if we decide to as a board to support that group. Yeah, well, the, a big part of that, uh, as I talked to the Alliance in the last meeting, is uh, having uh, information down there for people, basically having a watershed map, that way people realize, hey, I am in this watershed, and then uh, things to do that are simple that any anybody can do uh, to help, you know, help the, the river, help the, the creeks, help all that kind of stuff. Uh, so that information will be there as part of New Paltz Kayaking Tours. Uh, um, you know, that's so that's uh, in, in the works uh, for that. So, would, would we, um, and this is a question to our board, maybe just for the sake of simplicity, um, instead of expecting some percent of some gross revenue, could we just ask Mr. Chapman to pay X number of dollars towards the, the annual Walk Harold River Alliance dues? Well, it's it's like easier bookkeeping. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in favor of that too. Actually, actually what would that be? Yeah, what is that? Then? Well, the thousand dollars is what the municipal dues would be, right? Done. Yep. Yeah. That makes complete sense to me. I mean, to to do it that way would be easier for me than I could do it at the beginning of the year and not have to worry about trying to. So would me. would that? Um, dues payment of a thousand dollars does that seem palatable as I far as in fair. exchange for the 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 uh, non-exclusive license it, it seems fair to me it seems like um, 
I mean, if, if this con continues to grow, then then uh, it, it shouldn't be a problem to to come up with that, and it seems like a, a fair fair okay. situation. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll put that in our draft, and then we'll we can all sleep on it. Sounds good. If you need anything from me, let me know. And don't give up on the idea of beautifying and bring this stuff in no. in the long term. We're, we like that. Sounds good. Okay, so um, I didn't have anything else correct on that I added. We're ready to move on to item three. Yes, correct. Okay, so I'd like to make a motion that we adopt local law amending section 212.13. This had to do with the NBR zoning code. And we had also received notice from the um, county planning board they said there was no county impact regarding these two changes so moved second second all in favor aye, aye. aye. okay and the next one is is really perfunctory it's a roll call roll call roll call it's a resolution you forgot trustee aye deputy mayor aye mayor rogers aye trustee rocker aye trustee Carr. aye Great. And the next one, this is really perfunctory stuff. Um, this would allow us to override the, the tax cap. Currently, our tax cap is set at 0.12%. Our tentative budget includes a 0% increase versus last year. Um, so all we did was adopt a law if we were looking to go above that um, tax cap we could vote on it as a board. So I'd like to make a motion that we adopt this local law. Second. And is this a roll call as well? Do we have the, you want to? Trustee Young? Aye. Deputy Mayor Oxley? Aye. Mayor Rogers? Aye. Trustee Rocker? Aye. Trustee Carr? Aye. Okay, number five. Um, so this has to do with our forthcoming um, project that uh, we received grant funding for related to our DEC consent order. And this project includes updating sanitary sewer lines on Elting, Lincoln, Lookout, Center, Bonacue, Fairview, Ridge, and Mohawk. So that's eight different sections of village streets. And we were awarded $600,000. Um, from CDBG, uh, this is this is HUD money. But part of this process is we have to um, officially uh, agree that this is part of a, a New York State initiative regarding smart growth public infrastructure. Um, so what I'm looking for is a motion that authorizes me to to sign this agreement that um, this project is in conjunction with. The smart growth criteria. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Are you going to update on 24 or something like that? Yeah, let me try to remember. Right, so we needed, um, and this is also related to to this this funding, we need a motion to approve publication of the notice to intent to request release of funds on March 24th of 16 for the Office of Community Renewal related to this project. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so that takes care of agenda 24, uh, agenda item 24. Um, the next topic was item number six. Um, there's a joint town and village emergency preparedness document that the village has never adopted previously so this was in your packet um, I've asked our attorney to review it before we go ahead and adopt it um, will is is on vacation and we keep asking him questions and asking him to review documents while he's on vacation and even though he's not supposed to he keeps doing work um, so this is just one that I did not ask him to do while he's on vacation but will anticipate his review. One thing that I know that the, the former supervisor had an issue with, and she was suggesting having two different versions of the document, which I believe the Emergency Preparedness Committee 
really wanted a single document for both the town and the village because there's some issue with like let's say there was an emergency in the village and the village declared a state of emergency how do we handle um, village authorities instructing town police to respond to the emergency so it seemed like that language had to be um, just thought about in the document um, so that's that's one thing that when you when you review the document just be mindful of I'd also like to point out that the document does need to be updated to reflect that this building also has generator capabilities oh, right because that's new yes so Ryan can you can you include um, Dennis's note and uh, when we okay. ask Will to review this, make sure that we, we should include some language that reflects that. And now, this copy says that it was re revised December 2015. Initial adoption was August 24th, 2000. So I, I think it would be good if we saw the original document as well. I just don't know what was revised. So you want to see some sort of track changes? Yeah, yeah. Um, Ryan, could you ask Lieutenant Lucchese, who leads the Emergency Preparedness Committee, if we could have an original version or some sort of track changes? And when you ask Lieutenant Lucchese that question, could you just CC the whole board so mm -hmm. we all are on that, that thread? You. Um, fire Department, Vehicle IMA, same thing wills on vacation he take he took a look at the the document he was looking at it through the lens of this would be an arrangement that would allow the village and the town to have both fire department and dpw vehicles and blue corrected the uh, the initial draft and said no this should only be for fire department vehicles we're not seeking uh an intermunicipal agreement that would be um, a part of uh, having the highway department maintain or repair DPW vehicles. So that's 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 not part of this agreement. So that change is in the in the midst of Will's review. Um, next item number eight. I'd like to make a motion that we set a public hearing for April thirteenth in anticipation of the governor opening. Uh, the consolidated funding application. So this would be a public hearing because we, we again would be seeking the uh, small cities grant, the CDBG um, grant ceiling of $600,000 that does not require a match. So we would be looking to um, fulfill that DEC sewer consent order. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And I just wanted to provide an update. So our village has been awarded this grant five out of the last six years. So I, I mentioned before the project. So last summer we did the project on Plattica Lab. This year we're going to do the project on Lincoln Lookout Center, et cetera, the, the, the total of eight streets. So what we're doing for this application is we're going to resubmit the application from 2014. So of the, 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 the one out of six times that we were not awarded, um, a grant was in 2014, and that was for outdated sewer lines. And it's basically kind of an area between Huguenot Street and Church Street and then the boundary to the north is Broadhead, and the boundary to the south is, I don't remember. I think it's North Front, yeah. So that's, that's your square. So there's needed um, sewer infrastructure upgrades in that section. So we're going to use the same, as much as the same uh, application from 2014. So that'll save us a little money engineering-wise. Mm -hmm. and. Our engineer uh, from 
Rainier and Larios, Rich Ruth and, and Blue and Nick, they're all completely supportive that that is a very important project and it makes a great deal of sense to basically resubmit that 2014 application. So that's the plan there. Um, next item, number nine, we got a letter from Carol Ford on Mill Rock Road. Uh, she had a couple of suggestions, one to make Mill Rock a, a one-way street. She feels with parking on both the east and west sides of that street that it's a little tight. And another item she was looking for was could we improve visibility when, when someone goes back out onto Main Street. Um, she feels like there's, there's a car spot that's a little too close that makes visibility turning onto Main Street difficult. So we could do a couple things. Um, one regarding the sign, we can see, or if, if there is even a sign at that corner. I know recently we, we added a sign at the corner of North Oakwood and Henry W. Because the law requires you to not park too close to any intersection, but not every street has a sign. So we put up a sign at North Oakwood. Um, we could check to see if there is a sign at this corner, and if there isn't, we could install one that says no parking from here to corner. And what do you guys think about a one-way street for Mill Rock just between John and, and Maine? Is that a, a terrible idea? Is it something we should have our planner drill down on? Well, I know that uh, area very well. I had an office there for many years. As I uh, drove down the street yesterday after reading this, uh, this letter. Um, a couple of spots on Mill Rock that were, were filled for the day were by an attorney and a chiropractor who have their offices at that building. It had nothing to do with the main course. But um, one other approach, I was, was at the um, planning board meeting when the main course was originally discussed. And um, at the time, that business was approved as catering without sit-down dining. And I wonder if we might take a look at um, the provisions upon which the main course is doing business and seeing if they're in compliance. I think they might need to provide some additional parking. I happen to know there is a, a parking lot directly across the street where my office used to be, which is never, ever used. And maybe if someone made some strong suggestions to the main course that they might want to see if they can utilize that lot for their customers. Um, there, you know, there is some parking on Mill Rock from the main course. And that's not in, in conjunction with the original plan that approved the business. I, that, that might be something to explore, but um, I, I know that others have asked whether main course is in compliance because of what was originally approved there and how the, the business is currently being used. And, and I believe that it is compliant. Our, our building inspector has taken okay. a, a close look at it. Um, so I don't think there's any issues there, but I wonder if we could maybe work with that business owner to encourage that business owner to, you know, explore some other parking opportunities um, that, that might be an option. You know, I would say, you know, that the issue that's described with the narrow streets and the, uh, I find that on, on, uh, on Oakwood as well and on, on Prospect as well. And, you know, whenever there's snow on the road, you need to pull over and make it a one-way street if someone's coming in the other direction. I find that mm -hmm. to be common to a lot of our streets, so I, I'm sympathetic to this situation, and the main course does make it a little unique, but I don't know that it's a, a new situation in the, the village of New Falls. Yeah, I, and I think the challenge with one-way streets, too, is you might alleviate one issue, and then you create new challenges. You know, when we, we took a close look at having a one-way street there on Inisav and Eltingav um, near the Mountain Laurel School. Like, I, I really liked that idea at first, and I think we batted it around as a board, and uh, the planner and I batted it around for a while, and it's just very hard to say, if you do this, these things are gonna get better, and then these other things will not get worse. So it's like, it, it seems like there's, there's often trade-offs um, so you got to be mindful of that. I, I don't know that just turning things into one ways, you know, it's a it's a small, tight village. I would say that um, more strongly than that, uh, one of the major planning 
uh, conditions that we've worked on in this village and that it's worked on generally uh, throughout uh, villages and towns in the United States is connectivity. And uh, if you make streets one way that have been two ways, you restrict connectivity. You force people to go in circular ways when they used to go in linear ways. And uh, I, I would not support this motion at all. I'm sympathetic uh, about parking on the street that creates problems for people. But as you say, this is a small village. And it's, it's not going to get any bigger. And the streets aren't going to get any bigger. And either we, uh, we do what we can to uh, facilitate traffic flow in other ways, maybe by restricting one parking place close to the corner or something of that sort, uh, fine. I would, I would consider any of those uh, options but I would be loath to make any of those small streets one way. And as the noise of my phone uh, shows, at least somebody's watching on Channel 23. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so we're not going to take a harder look at one way. I'm okay with that. I, I, yeah. I'm not a fan of one way either. Well, exactly. So that's what I was going to say. Let's, let's take a look at the sign. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe it makes some sense to even change the law on that street if there's an issue with visibility. We could we can improve the distance from the corner, um, but we'll we'll take a look at that. I'll um, Ryan, can you make sure? Can you send a, a note to Blue and ask him about that sign if there is a sign at that corner, and and just CC the full board. Um, Okay, next discussion is the, um, the playground and then the ball courts in front of St. Joseph's and just capital planning for this outdoor recreation generally. Um, I shared a note with, with our board using the same company that installed the playground uh, 21 years ago. Yeah. The current estimate is about $150,000 just for <coughs> materials and that would involve a community volunteer effort where just as it was done 21 years ago folks get together and they actually work for a full week to do that installation um, the more I think about playgrounds and how robust the the materials have to be I mean like think about it this is stuff that's outdoors 24 hours a day for children in all weather no splitters. you got kids hanging yeah. on it this has to be really robust stuff and I think what's really important because I have heard rumors in the community about this playground failing or that the wood is rotten and um, our DPW does a really fantastic job of keeping a close eye on it and anytime materials need right. to be replaced they, they take care of it right away. Um, they updated the, the bridge within the playground that was, mm -hmm. was being compromised um, and you know I, I really uh, chatted with Nick at the playground and, and chatted with Blue separately and I really tried to you know get from them like guys if if you you know you're looking at this playground where do you anticipate any other things like uh, that would need updates in the in the very near term and you know they, they both said they can't imagine any significant repairs within the next two years mm -hmm. and just from a capital planning perspective we, we were all on the same page that the, the playground has a solid five years left so it makes sense for us to begin organizing a group with kind of a within three to five year window let's replace what's there um, raise the money um, for the equipment, organize the, the, the volunteer effort. It, it seems like our timing is actually very good um, and we have a very safe playground for the next few years so it'll take some time to organize this effort. Um, so that's the playground. Any, any thoughts? Does that seem yes. to make sense in terms of a, a capital plan for the playground? I like it a lot. I like yeah, it too. And, and also looking at our rec recreation fees for new development that comes in. Um, one thing, 
I know a lot of people are saying it's a wooden structure, but most of, most of the material is actually re recycled plastic. It just looks like wood. Yeah, all the decking is, is Trex. It's the original yeah. Trex. Um, and then the rest of the, the, the vertical pieces are the, the pressure treated lumber. I think logistically a, a way to maybe accomplish this task would be to reach out via the daycare centers and the kindergartens in the village and town and reach out to the parents of those children who will be the ones using it over the next 10 years and would probably have a vested interest in, in, uh, in raising those funds and making it happen. I, I, would, I like that idea and I would go farther a bit uh, because uh, I'm a grandparent of uh, quite a number of grandchildren who have very happily used that playground. And uh, it's one of the best that the kids have seen or played in. And I bet you there are uh, not just parents, but grandparents uh, in our village who would be very happy to participate. So I think there's got to be a way for us to reach out to a fairly large population. Um, we have three to five years to work on it. I think we should plan something. And uh, I would be happy to participate in the planning. Yeah. Um, I, I think what we really need to do is uh, so kind of get some community members excited about participating on, on a committee. Um, but it would be great if we had a village board member kind of facilitate it and at least focus on getting that ball rolling. I'd be happy to do it. So you want to be the I have the, the youngest playground. child of anyone at the table. The so playgrounds I are. And I, I can add, like, because I live across the street from this playground, it is used every hour of the day, all year round, regardless of the weather. Rain, snow, there are always cold. There are always people using that playground. Additionally, this playground is used by many more people than just our community. There are people who drive from New York City to Albany, and they know that this is a nice playground to stop at and use. It is an incredibly well-used playground. Another um, point, I know in the past we had um, something worked out with Mountain Laurel um, because they do use it as their recess place. Um, and I, I think we should check on the status of our agreement with them because I, I know in the past there were times when we were trying to push to get our agreement signed and it, and it took a while. So this is something that I think Nancy Branco could could um, fill us in in terms of the status of our agreement with them. Dennis, do you want to um, take a look at that as since you're the playground czar? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> um, what a cool, cool. title. Yeah. yeah. Wow. So al along the same lines as uh, outdoor recreation capital planning, um, we had a, a community member meet with myself and, and Blue and Nick, and we were taking a hard look at the ball courts in front of St. Joe's. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, so we, we had already received a, a quote for the fence. The fence around those ball courts is failing and in desperate need of being replaced. So that fence quote is um, $31,695. Um, that doesn't include any work that needs to be done to the retaining wall. So on the, the northern side of the, those ball courts, that retaining wall is failing. So any fence that goes in there is only going to make sense if it's going into a, a stabilized wall. So that's an additional expense. Um, but the, the community member who um, you know, was, was very much in favor of money being spent to upgrade the, the pickleball courts. And then we also, so we have two pickleball courts and a basketball <coughs> court. The, the current pickleball courts are really not of uh, regulation. They're, the size of the courts are fine, but you need to be more comfortable when you play. You need additional space behind the, the rear lines. So if we're going to spend money on updating these courts, we really have to be very mindful of installing courts that that can be used to their full potential um, so I have our DPW guys coming up with a budget that would include um, new blacktop resurfacing the courts for pickleball as well as basketball um, the fence 
the retaining wall, and if we're going to dream, we're going to dream big, and we're going to get some prices for some LED lighting. Um, I guess I, I, I think uh, that could be you know very exciting if we uh, if we had that to to offer to the community. But again, this is you know with the fence quote at 32k and just kind of back of the envelope estimates with with blue and Nick, we're thinking you're talking about at least 150 thousand dollars. So you got a playground project at 150 plus volunteer wow. efforts, a uh, Hasbrook uh, ball courts project of you know maybe 150 another roundup with the fence uh, another 50 k. So you're talking about 350 thousand dollars just in terms of capital expenditures um, to update and improve those those outdoor rec offerings which I think is incredibly important and and those are valuable assets in a, in a in an active community like ours but um, that will probably only happen if we have a, a strong community effort and and the the individual who you met with I think she was very focused on on trying to facilitate and make that happen I believe she had also been very active in terms of raising some money and organizing the playground at Moriello. So we have people who have done this before, um, but we have some big capital projects yeah. in front of us. I'd like to point out that if we're dreaming big, I would like to have us remove some of the poison ivy that is behind the ball, uh, the courts. I know as a t-ball coach, the baseballs roll down that hill and they get down by that fence and that is all poison ivy. I can't tell you how many times I came home from baseball practice with poison ivy. And as soon as the ball goes down, you don't want any of the kids to do it. You got to suck it up and do it yourself. And yeah, it's uh, well, one thing we were thinking of because we were thinking of actually using that that embankment, like could there be some seating there? And when we were getting a price for the fence, you know, there are no um, exits to that east side of the court. So it would make sense if we had doors that you could um, go towards that embankment if there was a, a, a door. So I, I think your idea of, well, let's have a door, but then let's also make sure that there's no poison ivy on that embankment, so. I have a question. Mm -hmm. what, what is pickleball? <laughs> I have no idea. Pickleball, pickleball is like paddle tennis. It's, okay. it's, uh, it's definitely a, an emerging popular sport that um, you walk by those courts and, you know, again, they're playing all hours, <laughs> all weather conditions. It's, uh, it's something that people seem to be enjoy, enjoying at that location. And as you stated, people stop in our community to use these things, so it actually helps our businesses too. Mm -hmm. It's not just for our families. Right. So, you know, when we think about capital planning and outdoor rec, you know, we have also spent a great deal of time thinking about the Millbrook Preserve. Um, so, you know, part of our deal with Peter Beanstalk is to arrange for um, having him make a, 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 best, a, a best effort to help us raise some money for low impact trails and signs and bog bridges and, and, and other bridges within that property that both the town and the village um, have purchased together. So we, we're going to have a lot of donors um, in this community being asked to contribute to, to, uh, to a few different important and exciting projects. You know, the, the playground, the ball courts, the Millbrook Preserve, and um, you know, I think we have to be very mindful about what we're asking for, and then we're also probably going to, you know, have to make up some shortcomings that the donors don't make up for, just in terms of general funds of both the village and town board. So, you know, if we if we want to dream big, and and have nice offerings for our the folks in our community, it's, it's going to require a great deal of effort and expense. Um, that's all I had on that topic. 
So the last time we were um, talking about how much to set for retainers for the planning board and the zoning board, so in our tentative budget, we have a planning board retainer of $10,000 and a zoning boards of appeal retainer of $4,000. And we were kind of batting it around philosophically. You know, I, I personally like the idea that if there's something um, where we're using uh, an attorney for the government's use, let's say we're writing code or we're involved in litigation, um, that's when those retainers should be used or for general questions regarding process or improving board process, you know, that's when those retainers should be used. But I generally am a proponent of applicants pay for their expenses. But, you know, we were, we were talking about how much we have. We've, we've raised this planning board retainer pretty significantly. Last budget cycle it was $4,000 and now we've moved it up to ten thousand dollars. I don't know if anyone else wants to comment on what we're doing there. Well, I would just comment is that that's all the planning board has asked for. So if uh, we're willing to go to ten thousand dollars, then the planning board, I believe, would be uh, quite happy with that. Um, one thing that we discussed when we hired the new ZBA attorney, Joe McKay, was having him spend some of that retainer to improve process for our ZBA and do some training. Um, we haven't done a whole lot of that since he's come on board. Um, I actually appreciate that our, that our ZBA is, uh, you know, keeps really tight purse strings and they're, they're very scared to, you know, use too much of, of Joe. So we're going to try to encourage them to, um, to use Joe. But I had a conversation with Joe about having him actually outline some trainings that he think would be necessary um, and how much it would cost per hour. And you know maybe something like we have our ZBA sit with him for an hour per month on a specific topic. And that would go partially towards this $4,000 retainer. But um, that, that's in the works. Um, any any further comments on that sounds good either I'm of those? With the budget you have it. okay next topic our planning board's been discussing recreation fees we have kind of an odd history or current arrangement where if you read our code um, the uh, section 212.23 it should be J3 um, talks about $5,000 per unit during the, the site plan review that the planning board does. So that would be a recreation fee collected um, by the village. Um, our recreation fee fund currently has about $42,000 in it, and that has been collected from past development projects. So as new projects are being developed, the expectation is that $5,000 per unit is collected. Also in our code, um, and I think this is maybe an unintended uh, situation where the per lot cost is under the, the subdivision review is $7,500 per lot. Um, we really need to kind of have something that's more succinct. I, I don't think it's reasonable to check to collect rec fees at subdivision and then also at site plan and we have two different fees for two different uh, things um, I I also kind of like the idea of just kind of flipping this all together and, and looking at it very differently you know maybe what we should do is collect a rec fee um, before granting a certificate of occupancy or a certificate of compliance and maybe attaching it to um, the per square foot of a project. So let's say you build a $3,000 single family home. Your fee is based on the square footage. If you build an X number of square foot apartment building, you know, because you, you, the way it stands now when it's per unit that let's say it's a 40 unit apartment building, it's $5,000 times 40. Whereas if you build 
a McMansion, it's five thousand dollars because your McMansion is a single unit. I, I, you know, we we want to encourage density. We want to encourage infill. You know, that's that goes along with the spirit of our our NBR code. Um, I asked the planning board to, to discuss that at their meeting, I think it was last week, and, and they batted that around a little bit. And they were able to come up with reasons why that isn't the easiest approach either. So this is uh, a discussion that's ongoing, but I was curious what you guys thought about rec fees and how to charge them. Um, uh, I was on the board when this uh, latest uh, change was made and I believe uh, the inconsistency is just one more instance where uh, we did not have a thorough check of uh, all of the text of our code to determine that uh, the $5,000 and $7,500 uh, items were in uh, uh, sync. I also can't tell you that I remember why we raised it. Um, I was uh, on the planning board when the fee was $3,000. So in a very short period of time, we've gone on some fees from $3,000 up to $7,500. And I, I do have a, a, a very strong feeling that, that it's out of line. It's, if we, we want to encourage infill and uh, affordable housing, and we're going to have some of that now, we, we're, we're on the brink of having some success in what we've been encouraging. Uh, we're, I believe we'll be discouraging people if we're going to be adding 7,500 to a, a, a lot line revision or a subdivision and then $5,000 per unit. Uh, yeah, I was gonna make the same point. We create this NBR to, to attract encourage business. The, but I, I just think we the, the code has to evolve as the village changes. We haven't had a situation where we had 40 unit projects coming in. Correct. So it wasn't an issue, but it is now. It is an um, issue now. So are you looking, Tim, for the planning board to solve this problem or make a suggestion? Or are you looking for both? Yeah. I'm curious. I, I just wanted us to, to sleep on it. And you know the planning board is, is wrestling with this concept. I just wanted to bring it to our attention. You mentioned the planning board uh, found some issue with the concept of switching to square footage. I'm curious what that feedback was. You know, I don't even remember um, someone, because I, I, I was at that meeting and I, I raised my hand and I said, what about square footage? And, and, and they had some response to that. It, it seemed pretty reasonable at the time, you know, late in the evening when my brain was mushy. But, but, um, but also their brain it was late in the evening there yeah. too. And uh, Which factor was equal? I mean, yeah, just a third category of recreation fees for multi-unit projects in excess of ten units would be a you know a way to go. We could we could I think work something like that out that would you know in excess of ten units back to three thousand dollars. Well, yeah, I and I think this rec, rec fee discussion is really important considering you know a couple of agenda items earlier we were talking about all the capital sure. planning that we would sure. like to do. We got forty-two thousand dollars in that rec fee fund. That's not going to pay for a whole lot. As as the playgrounds are, would we have access to that money, or are we looking to fundraise all of it? I'd prefer to fundraise all of it and save it for something else. But at the same time, if we're asking community members, and we have money in a rec fee for this purpose, and as you stated, we have a number of different fundraising initiatives in the community. And uh, I believe it was you that used the term recently, donor fatigue. I, I learned that from Peter Beanstalk. Yeah. So it was. Um, hopefully, as time goes on, this fund can build up, and we can look to it for some of our capital improvements instead of just relying on the community. But well, a hundred, uh, forty-eight unit uh, new structure uh, with a just a modest three thousand dollar unit. Uh, fee would bring in $140,000, and I haven't even used my calculator. Maybe you should be the playground czar, Tom. So, yeah, so you were suggesting use of that funds to start, a, to start off as, as a as something to start off fundraising well, with? 
I mean, we're really, because Tim kind of uh, illustrated this five-year window, so it's not like we need to take money out of the fund now to get started. But as this fund continues to grow and we're looking to the community for money, I do feel that as we get to the three, four-year mark and we look at what we have in that fund, we shouldn't just be relying on the community to come up with this money, that we should also be using this fund as it is at, for its stated intent. Basketball courts, pickleball courts, and, and playgrounds are the very defi definition of recreation. Sounds like recreation to me. Yep. Um, so you guys will come up with a suggestion for the next time we talk about this. <laughs> um, next item, I want to set a public hearing for April 13th regarding our tentative budget for 7 p.m. at Village Hall. That's Second. my motion. Second. All in favor? Well, Aye. what is the point where we approved the tentative? Did we, we're not approved the tentative budget with that. We motion? did. We approved it last week, when we did our budget presentation. We approved the tentative budget, so it exists. Okay. And now, all we're doing is setting a public hearing. To the end of this month was the deadline for approving the tentative. I, I understand. The reason I ask, uh, in conversation with the treasurer uh, this week, uh, she indicated that. Um, this meeting would be the last opportunity to make any changes to the tentative budget, but I did want to suggest at least one. That's why I brought it up. So before we take a vote, uh, I guess if I'd like to make a motion once we complete this vote to to uh, discuss the tentative budget again. Um, sure. Second. Okay. That's, I just didn't want to say aye, aye before, you know, and, and have, cl close out that topic. Before. Right, and then we, we still have room to, to tweak the budget, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I understand. This is just kind of, I, I think, formalities that the tentative budget exists and well the tentative budget is what we're going to have a public hearing on and yep. if we're going to you know make any any changes that might i don't think major but any significant changes i, I say i want to do it before then yep so i am on the scheduling the public hearing and then I right so so we're, we're all in favor I, we've just agreed to set a public hearing for april 13th and 7 at village hall for the tentative budget um, and now you wanted to talk about the tentative budget yeah uh, i want to talk and i want to i want to make a make a motion um, i am i expressed concern at the, the last meeting um, we are uh, in the process of uh, interviewing and hiring a uh, a new village clerk and uh, we want to make sure we have the ability to hire the, the, the best talent and, and give ourselves the ability to make that office as strong as possible. Um, my, uh, and that's, that's, where my, that's where my interest lies. And I, I think before we have the public hearing, if we want to, if we want to uh, strengthen that office, I think it's, it's appropriate to do that before then. Uh, looking at the uh, year to years, uh, going back a couple of years ago, the clerk's office was uh, budgeted at $78,000, and uh, the proposed budget is uh, in the 50s. Uh, I think it's 54 and change, don't have it right in front of me. But I, I guess my, uh, my desire was to uh, take the line A1410.100, which is the office for personnel in the clerk's department, and raise that number to 74.6 from what is uh, proposed. Uh, that would still leave us under the under the number that uh, was from two years ago. So it seems like a number that the village can sustain. What's the increase? The dollar amount? It's about twenty thousand uh, dollars. Do the increase would be twenty thousand dollars. Doesn't obligate us to use that, but it would give us the ability to uh, utilize that in our hiring if we uh, if we find the need. I think we also there has been some informal discussion about looking at the uh, compensation levels. Uh, in that office uh, with, an, with an eye toward retaining staff. And I think that would give us the ability to uh, achieve that goal as well. I agree. So I guess I'll, I'll make the motion that we uh, increase uh, line A1410.100 in the tentative budget to number 74.6. Are we, uh, are we able to identify $20,000 in savings from any place else? 
Well, I anticipated that question, and uh, I would be happy to uh, be happy to sit with the uh, with the treasurer and the mayor and both and, and try to find that money. I, um, there's also I, sorry, Don, but there's also fifty one thousand dollars that's currently set aside for sidewalks that looks like it may not be used, or there might be more than fifty one thousand dollars used. Right, depending on. Well, when I looked at uh, revenues versus appropriations for the, the current budget, I, 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 I'm confident. I think that there, you know, that if we look, we can find that money somewhere. I haven't done the work. Right. I just, you know, consulted with the treasurer yesterday on, on, you know, some of these numbers, and so it's kind of fresh for me. But I did want to did want to make that motion again before we had a public hearing, and this is my last chance to do so. so. I just want to make sure that we don't uh, do anything to uh, jeopardize our efforts to stay. Under the tax cap, that we that we don't raise the taxes. Well, I think that the keeping of the tax cap and, and a zero budget are, are different things. I think we're yeah, we certainly are, have the ability to keep, keep under the tax cap. And I would I would desire to try to find that money somewhere. I just don't have the, the magic bullet. Gotcha. This meeting I, this I understand. Uh, I understand that one thing doesn't uh, logically depend on, but financially it might. Yeah, no, I understand your point as well. Yeah. Ryan, did we uh, did we? Um, move to accept the tentative budget last week yes we did we, we did. did so yeah. that's been accepted so um well it's been accepted so we can't I, I don't think we can and and what we just did now is we arranged for a public hearing of that tentative budget so i think what we're doing here is we're making it known that we are also taking a hard look at increasing this this line for clerk salary. Um, okay, so that doesn't affect the tentative budget at all. It just well, we're just making making it clear that we're we're taking a hard look at uh, at this idea. Well, that that could be a way to go forward. My my understanding, and she's not here from my discussion with the you know with the treasurer. She volunteered to me that when we were talking about this stuff, that that tonight would be the last opportunity to modify. And change the tentative budget. So uh, that was my desire. Um, okay, uh, I don't think it ma yeah, matters I, 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 either I, way. Again, I think it's a procedural thing. I, I just, uh, if we're going to present something to the public, I would like this number to be in there. I think the most important thing. Well, but it's also somewhat of a moving target too, because you, you're saying that you want to take a harder look at maybe identifying some other savings. So maybe we would still end up with the zero percent. Well, so I think the most important thing is that that you just said that we intend to look to it, to raise this the salary amount at the clerk's office okay and i would i guess and, and I'm, I'm good with that and i would if that's to be the approach i just uh would say that um if there's any sense on this board um in opposition to that um i would appreciate knowing that up front so i didn't spend a lot of time trying to find twenty thousand dollars somewhere else i i think we can all I, i'm Personally, I'm I'm fine with the idea of doing you know taking okay. a look and, and trying to find that savings. No, so, and even if we can't find the savings, you know maybe Just maybe we end up with a with a, a slight tax increase mm -hmm. to pay for that additional twenty thousand. I got what I need. Then let's let's move forward. Yeah. Okay. Fourteen. Fourteen. So, um, what was in your packet was actually the the original proposed OSI lease from their attorney, Bob Anderberg. So I circulated on Sunday the, um, the version that included uh, tweaks after uh, the planner, Blue, and myself reviewed it, as well as our attorney. Um, the key thing for me was just that what we were doing was only committing to keeping this site clear of ice and snow. Um, there was some other language that um, that was a little vague that I that I that we we look to remove, but um, I just wanted to see if anyone else had feedback regarding this this lease because now it's in OSI's hand. So if they come back with any tweaks, I want to see if anyone else had had thoughts on it. So this is a, a ten-year lease. That where the village would be leasing a 15-acre parcel to OSI as part of the River to Ridge trail program. Yes. So the 15-acre parcel west of the Walk Hill 
where it's referred to as the boat launch, but no one is launching any boats there because the embankment <laughs> is all eroded away. Um, Great place to fall into the river. Yeah. <coughs> so no, nothing on that. So yeah. we'll, we'll we'll hear back from Bob Anderberg um, to see what kind of uh, tweaks he has. Uh, next, uh, I just wanted to um, have the board motion to approve that our building inspector, Holly Esposito, attend a three-day conference in Poughkeepsie for $300 per person. So moved. She's joining Bryant Arms, our building inspector head, and Rich Travis, also on our building inspector. Second. All in favor? I have a question. Will someone from another department um, staff the department while they're out? So so that's that's, you know, 15A is that we're making an announcement we're going to have partial building department operations during those three days. So we have um, Christina, Christina, who is our planning and zoning secretary. She works either 18 or 19 hours per week. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we could set it up that, that she's doing her days on, you know, I'll see if that's an option. And is the other... Um part-time building inspector also going to be? He's, he's attending the training. He's a, so we have three the people department. attending the training. The, the entire department will be in Poughkeepsie for the training. Okay. And, and in as the case I, of an emergency, someone is available to come back as the plan, correct? Yeah. Okay. Just to make Always. sure that it's stated. Yeah. And I, I shared with you last week when I was discussing this with Nancy. She was very excited that they could all travel together, so we only have to do <laughs> mileage reimbursement for one car. Terrific. Okay. Um, Save 20 bucks. Yes. Every $20 matters. Okay. Um, so, Ryan, may I ask you to send a note to Building Inspector Bryant Arms to see if we could have Christina for that week. Could she put, could she do all of her days during these, these three days during this training? Just to have as much coverage as possible. And just, you know, definitely CC me on that note. Um, next item was uh, an amended IMA between the town and the village to extend the term of the the uh, backup water supply agreement. Um, it was currently a 10, a 20 year term with a 10 year extension. So for all intents and purposes, a 30 year term, we were looking to extend that to 100 years. And we had our planning board or our water and sewer attorney, Dave Merzig, draft that amendment. And what is the rationale? Um, Tom, do you want to comment on why we would be doing that? So we didn't have, so we, wouldn't have to go through the uh, process of negotiating a new lease in 20 years. I think there was also there was also some um, concern about this. This had to do with um, so the DEP. Yeah, I'm is, sorry to say that mine is too abbreviated, but I'm I'm quite I, I don't quite remember the details of the arguments that we made. Right. So the DEP is is looking to purchase this property with their money, and then the town of New Pulse would own this property at 101 Plains Road. Yeah. And what the DEP was interested in doing is um, having right of first refusal if the town were to ever sell the property, they wanted to be able to buy it back for a dollar if the town was ever going to sell it. So by extending this IMA, you basically kind of, it, it, it's a funny thing. It's like, why would the town ever look to, well, I guess the fear is if the town wanted to monetize this asset, why should they benefit from monetizing this asset that the, the DEP paid for? It was a way for the DEP to protect their investment and the town um, just, didn't want to have that stipulation. So by extending the IMA, um, you're basically uh, kind of 
requiring the town to have this um, this usage. So they, they basically couldn't sell the property to someone else or to the DEP. Am I explaining that correctly, Tom? I think so, yes. Yeah. So in a way, it kind of protects... It, it protects the village. It protects uh, the village, yes. And, and keeps this source of uh, fresh water in, essentially, in, uh, even though it's not in our ownership, in our control. Like our, our, our water and sewer attorney thinks this is a, this is a, a good opportunity for the village. He didn't think that the bad, the, the uh, former uh, arrangement was a bad arrangement. He thought it was a good arrangement, but he thinks this is a better arrangement. Okay, I, 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 I understand what I hear. I, I think this is the very reason we have a two meeting rule. I'd like to look into this a little bit more and understand a little bit better. Absolutely. So, um, and I was looking, I think I, because I don't believe this was in your packet at all, and I think right. I made an error by not sharing this uh, draft agreement with the board, so I'll make sure that that gets out to everyone. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's just a four-page document. There's really, there's really very little. Actually, we, I printed out hard copies for everyone. You'll see there's, there's actually a typo in this initial draft that still has uh, Supervisor Zimmet in there instead of uh, Supervisor Batez. But everyone has a hard copy, but I'll also circulate an electronic copy as well. Next, um, we've been discussing this concept of a conservation easement or parkland designation at the Millbrook Preserve. Um, you know, I, I think the way to move forward, Dennis and I had a conversation about this. You know, what we really need to have happen at the Millbrook is for this concerted um, planning and budgeting effort to take place so that we're going to be looking to to donors with the help of Peter Beanstock to raise money for signs and bridges and, and trail improvements. And I, and I think um, including a CE designation, if it's, if it's believed that donors will be motivated um, to contribute to a property that, that has a conservation easement, I think it makes sense to include that as part of the plan if you're um, interested in, in donating to the Millbrook Preserve to, you know, to, to make this the, the outdoor rec preserved area that we want it to be, you know, one of the things that your donation will contribute to is, um, is a conservation easement um, in addition to parkland designation. I think it makes sense to pursue both. And as you stated uh, last or two weeks ago, there's no reason that we can't go to a conservation easement later once we establish parkland. So yeah, you can you can uh, add a conservation easement to a property at any time. So we could pursue the the parkland designation in the near term, and then um, once funds are raised, um, pay for a conservation easement. But I, I, I like that as a as an approach. If anyone else has, additional we have thoughts. community members that are willing to raise money for the Millbrook. We should absolutely work together to raise money together with a common goal, as opposed to trying to raise money separately and working against each other. It's all about collaboration and working together. And quite frankly, if there's been a lot of doomsday scenarios thrown around as far as what could potentially happen. I get the sense from this board that we do not have to worry about doomsday scenarios for at least three and a half years. And if we can raise this money in three and a half years and get a conservation easement and get all the trailheads and everything else we really need to do for the community, that will be a huge win. And I'm very excited that we can do it together instead of working against each other. And I can also share, um, talking about the Millbrook today with, with Blue, um, so we have a lot of materials down at the wastewater treatment plant parking area. And what we're trying to do is provide more parking mm -hmm. for the community. So Blue has been diligently moving those materials out to Clearwater. This is a collaborative effort with the town. And he was saying, he's like, you know what you really should have been doing because you guys have this idea of, of creating some sort of like 
six car parking area for the for the Millbrook Preserve, whether it's up near Duzine or at the top of North Mannheim or at the top of Bonnecue, um, you should have been moving those materials to create this six car parking area directly there. And uh, he said, you know, all we need to do is identify where we want the parking area and we can put down the, the stone and that would be a great initial um, first improvement made to that area to make this, this, this uh, you know, the beginning of being accessible to the public. So, you know, this should be kind of a, a low-tech solution to getting, getting improved access. And, you know, we can do that in the near term. And I spoke with uh, council person Julie Lillis about this today, and, and I asked her to try to identify, you know, which parking area should we be doing this in? You know, if, if Blue was very comfortable with the idea of, of, of having his crew get that done. Um, I'm uh, really supportive and appreciative of the positive efforts of uh, Tim and Dennis to kind of figure out a, a happy way to uh, get to where we all want to go. I, uh, what I don't want to see happen is this community move away from its traditional embrace of conservation easements. I understand the, I understand the issues and where this land may have some uh, attributes which uh, may not make us as concerned with some other properties, but I do know over a long period of time, this community, whether it be the town, the village, you know, what, you know or outlying areas, has embraced the, the uh, concept of conservation easements. There's a lot of them surrounding this property, and I just, I just, uh, I'm understanding and, and on board with everything that's been said on this topic, in this issue. But I, I, I do want to make sure that moving forward, that that as we see other opportunities as a community, that that we don't find ourselves pointing to this as a as a precedent. I would like to continue to embrace that concept. My my vote probably would be to establish a CE for this property, but I, I'm very impressed by what I heard from the public last week. I'm impressed and I want to encourage what I'm hearing from Dennis and Tim in terms of, you know, we have a rough situation here, let's be creative and figure out a way to, to make it happen. So I, I'm going to support that, but I, I also want to just state my very strong support for the use of conservation easements and, and next time we uh, are faced with this question, you probably know where I'm going to come down. Right. I think it's important, though, to, to differentiate, though. Conservation easements make a great deal of sense for privately held properties, but what private landowners don't have is the ability to, to create parkland designation. So parkland designation also provides um, some conservation. So, you know, we have a tool in, in terms of parkland designation that, that shouldn't be overlooked either. And um, But if if donors are interested in paying for a conservation easement in addition to parkland designation, um, I think that's, that's perfectly, perfectly reasonable if, uh, if that's in, you know, part of that, that fundraising effort. What do we need to do? What do we need to do? Um, you have a motion in front of us for parkland designation or you got to work that up? I think we're currently working well, we on a wish we, list to determine how much money needs to be raised, and then we would move forward from there. Yeah. Sounds good. And we can discuss this with, uh, with the town board at an, at well, an upcoming joint meeting. But this uh, land, to pursue park land, this land at this moment yeah. has neither parkland nor conservation. Correct. Neither par parkland designation nor conservation easement. Do we need to do anything in the interim? Let's do that then. Let's let's pursue parkland designation for, for Does it our cost property. us anything? To it just cost us uh, uh, attorney involvement, and we'd have to. It, it's essentially the uh, creation of a law. Okay. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't extensive cost. If we can get that level of protection in now, and then increase it to the conservation easement later once funds are raised, then I think that's a win for everybody. Yeah, I. I I definitely see the cons conservation easement as something that will come to pass. Um, just knowing the number of people who have worked on preserving the Milbit Preserve for decades. So 
um, you know, I'm pretty confident that there's been enough interest in it in, in um, the past. So I like moving forward. So we're, we're agreed that we will seek uh, parkland designation uh, as a first step and uh, not in any way thereby obviate the possibility of the conservation easement mm -hmm. in the predictable future. Well said. Do we need to have a motion or we just have an understanding of the board? I think an understanding is fine. We would need the language for park line designation okay. to, to vote on. Well, will somebody be able to develop that language in the uh, near future? Yeah, I'll, I'll find out what's involved in, in pursuing that. Um, next item, uh, Dennis asks about the idea of a community-wide yard sale. So I had this idea, and I just wanted to bring it to the board to get some uh, feedback and collaborative approach. We were very fortunate to have business owners in our community that have been, for the most part, supportive of the bag ban. But the one part, the bag ban, as much as I love the environmental aspect of it, the one part I've never been comfortable with is the additional expense that we're placing upon our business owners. So I've been trying to brainstorm something that we can do on a down weekend to bring more people into town that can help support our business owners. And the community-wide yard sale is the spaghetti that's stuck to the wall, so to speak. So the idea is, and I'm not even sure that there's anything that we would need to do as a board, um, but the idea is that just we get the word out that the New Paltz community is having a yard sale on such and such date and encourage all of the members of the community to have a yard sale on that day. Isn't, isn't there all like haven't hasn't the community done this in the past where there's been a weekend where uh, folks commonly have yard sales I have a, yeah I have a feeling that one was um, instigated by the town for some reason I feel yeah like supervisor opens and spearhead one or two of those yes so why don't we contact Laura at the New Paltz for you Center and see if anything like that is in the works if they're because I think that makes a good idea. Both the town and village board can do a good job of, of getting the word out, encouraging residents to have yard sales, and then getting the word out that that date has been agreed upon. Do you want so? Yeah, I can I can follow Laura? up with Laura, and um, if it's okay with everybody else, I'd like to reach out to the Chamber of Commerce and see if Kathy's if this is something that they can get behind and support and really get the word out. Great. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Also, with that, if some if the chamber was involved, um, it might be a good idea to also use their parking lot uptown. You know, for any people who wanted to just show up there. I've I've and got a bunch of ideas in the back of my head. Good. I was actually thinking the middle school parking okay. lot. Um, my wife actually had an idea. There is a concept. I'm going to butcher the name, but I think it is a Kinder Market is the idea and it's actually children running a flea market so to speak for to get rid of their unwanted old items to other children and it actually teaches children how to you know work in a free market and negotiate and figure out what they want versus what other people want and so we were kind of thinking maybe we could reach out to the middle school we could have something like that happening there and maybe parking at the middle school but maybe i'm just getting ahead of myself I, I think Laura is a, a great contact too about, you know, throw, bounce that idea yeah, off of sure. Laura at the Reuse Center. Um, next item, we need a resolution to a point, it, it can be anyone on our staff, but we, we thought it made sense to appoint Nancy. We need a, um, a contact, um, when, we're, when we're pursuing grants, we need someone to be the point person regarding equal opportunity and minority women-owned business. You know, there are certain criteria um, and boxes that need to be checked in terms of applications, so we need a point person within our staff. So I'd like to make a motion that we appoint Nancy to this position. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And then, you know, here's an example of one. Um, we, we, uh, we have this contract regarding the 
Water Street culvert replacement project. We were awarded $246,000 from the DEC. So this is a, um, an example where we need this, uh, a person with this designation. So I just need uh, a resolution authorizing me to execute this contract. It's a roll so, call. So, so, so moved. Second. Trustee Evans. Aye. 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 Mayor Rogers. Aye. Aye. Trustee Rocker. Aye. Aye. Trustee Aye. Aye. Okay, next item is uh, I'd like to make a motion that we accept the, the fire contract and authorize me to, to sign that contract for 2016-2017. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, the next two items, um, I wanted to get uh, additional information about both of them before discussing them at our board. And then... Um, so you want to skip those? Yeah, now? I want to skip both of them. 24, we already did. And then Senator I'd like to make a motion. Uh, bill, bills and claims, that's a roll call. Yeah. Aye. Trustee Eric? Aye. 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 Trustee Aye. Aye. Trustee Aye. And then there was definitely something that I added Senator at the Terry end. Sewer upgrade. Right, so um, this is something that was added at the table and all of this is is it's a sample letter um, that has been used by the village board in the past you'll see the letterhead is from the previous administration and it's just a, a sample letter that we will send to the the residents on um, you know those those handful of streets that are just north of Main Street it's a final notice saying that they need to comply with the, um, the the consent order regarding sanitary sewer. So I just wanted to get approval that we um, can send out these final notices. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Does anyone have stuff to discuss in exec? I don't. I don't. Motion to adjourn? Second. All in favor? Aye. Not bad. Why did I turn my Yeah. You mentioned the main course, I get texts. <laughs> you got that too? You guys want to turn these off? What's that, 274 100?